Hello and welcome to the close air support theory lesson of the 130 seconds virtual wing. This lesson is intended for pilots JTAX and FECAs undergoing their initial CAS qualification and prior to starting practical CAS exercises. The presentation that will be used for this lesson contains highlights from our wing's CAS TTP document. The pilot or JTAC preparing for his practical exercise should also review this document. You can find the link to the presentation in the video description. In the wing, we try to stick to real-life practices as much as can possibly be expected when playing on a PC. Our TTP as well as this lesson are based on some publicly available documents as shown here. Also in this lesson, I will be referencing to other wing documents such as the Airbus TTP and the Air Warfare Doctrine document. The presentation is divided into three sections. The first section is relevant for JTAX and CAS pilots undergoing their first steps in the closer support qualification. The second section has specific topics for JTAX and FECAs. The third section will be added later on and will focus on advanced topics. To begin, let's go over a few basic definitions. The official definitions are provided here. CAS is basically what we do when we have aircraft attacking targets with friendly ground forces in close proximity. When this is done, we need to carefully coordinate the ground and air fires and maneuvers in order to prevent blue-on-blue -blue fires and to maximize the efficiency of the air assets and the way they support the ground force. The terminal attack controller provides the actual control and the clearances of weapons release in the CAS scenario. The individuals qualified to perform terminal attack control duties are the JTAC and the FECA. The JTAC does so from ground level, usually from within the ground force utilizing the air close air support, whereas the FECA provides similar control from an aircraft. Depending on the situation, we can use one of three types of control. Type 1 control is typically used when the target is in close proximity to friendly units and the ordnance being used is unguided. In this situation, the trajectory of the ordnance is depending on the flight profile of the attacking aircraft. Therefore, the JTAC must have visual contact with the target and the attacking aircraft, assess the geometry, and only then approve the release of ordnance. Basically, the JTAC looks at the aircraft and determines that its nose is not pointing at friendly units. This is inherently a complex procedure. The JTAC will sometimes ask for flares to be deployed by the attacking aircraft shortly before the weapon release point. This helps the JTAC to visually acquire the aircraft well in advance in order to allow for the attack geometry assessment and clearing the actual release of weapons. Type 2 control is typically used for attacking targets using guided ordnance or when the JTAC is unable to see the target. The use of guided weapons may be done from long range where the JTAC will not be able to see the attacking aircraft prior to ordnance release and even if he could, the ordnance may be maneuvering mid-flight. Type 3 control can be used when we need to perform more than one attack during a single engagement and there is a good distinction between the target and friendly units. Such distinction may be a distance or a landmarks like a river, road, ridge, etc. It should be noted that for Type 2 and 3, even though not mandatory, the JTAC should try and visually acquire the attacking aircraft to improve safety even further and increase situational awareness as much as possible. The official definitions for each type of control can be seen in this slide. If there are no friendly forces present on the ground, then air assets can operate inside kill boxes with a relative high degree of freedom. This is typical for armed reconnaissance missions, in which any military units detected inside the killbox may be considered hostile and a valid target. However, when friendly forces are a factor, then airspace in the vicinity of the friendly force may be defined as a ROS, or a Restricted Operation Zone. The ROS will be under the control of the terminal attack controller, whose job is to make sure the ground units are getting the support they need in a safe manner. A CAS operation may take place on our side of a front line of own troops or deeper into enemy grounds, for example when special operations involving ground forces are taking place. The air operations inside the rows are tightly controlled and coordinated. This is essential to deconflict the air and ground units from mutual ground movement and fires, as well as to deconflict air assets from other air operations that may be taking place in the same area. Here we can see the flow of closer support operation. 
Next, we will dive into the details of each block. As in other instances of communications in a tactical situation, we start by authenticating the other station we are talking to. This way we verify we are talking to a friendly and not an enemy playing radio games. The authentication method can either use an AET100 table or a RAM road, and will be decided ahead of mission. Anybody needed a refresher on using those authentication methods should look it up in the Wing LXTTP document. Routing and safety of flight is not a one-time thing, but is maintained and amplified throughout the CAS operation. The goal is to mitigate hazards for all aircraft involved so they can all execute their missions while flying around in a safe manner. As the aircraft approaches the airspace, it will be directed to the CP or contact point by the relevant C2 agency, AirWax for example. In the CP, the aircraft would hold in a defined flight block until cleared into the airspace by the owner, JTAC or FAK. Any flight arriving to the airspace would receive the traffic and airspace update, which is meant to facilitate a level of situational awareness regarding the various risk factors in the airspace, as outlined here. The traffic airspace update will at the very least include stack details of holding areas and flight blocks. If friendly artillery or enemy anti-air air threats are relevant, the details will be communicated in the SAT format as outlined here. The contact point is the first in a series of airspace coordination measures or ACMs and will be located outside of the restricted airspace. Whenever an, a new CAS asset arrives at the CP, the JTAC or FAK will try to get him checked in and pulled into the area of operation in order to keep the CP free for additional CAS flights. The IP or initial point is a point that's been pre-planned. It will typically be placed over a distinct terrain feature, like a village, lake or a mountain, so that the pilot can more easily navigate to it via Mark 1 eyeball. The IP will also be communicated with lat long and elevation MSL. An IP will typically be between 5 and 15 nautical miles from the target area for a fixed wind aircraft. This assists in adequate standoff distance from any possible threats in the area, while still allowing for observation to the target area and relatively short time of flight to conduct attacks. When giving names to the IPs, it is preferred to use same zim for all names, and to add some logic to the names and base them on directions from the target area. A keyhole is a hasty method for establishing IPs and holding areas. Point Echo is the center point and is located over a distinct feature such as a bridge, distinct building, etc. But, and this is critical, never over friendly forces. From Point Echo we have four cardinal directions, Alpha to the north, Bravo to the east, Charlie to the south and Delta to the west. Non-cardinal bearings may of course also be used, and with the number indicating the distance we have ourselves an IP. It should be noted that when using keyhole, an IP provided by the JTAC means no closer than the specific distance. Point echo can also be used to define an orbit with a minimal distance. See the example at the bottom of the slide. We have two basic types of holdings depending on the threat level. In a permissive environment, the CAS aircraft can orbit in a wheel relatively close and around the target area. When orbiting, lines 1, 2 and 3 in the CAS brief will be non-applicable. A non-permissive environment would necessitate the holding to be further away in a specific area. The IP will then be placed outside the anti-air threat area, and lines 1, 2 and 3 will include specific navigation data as required. The holding pattern may then be a racetrack or a figure 8 to maximize line of sight of sensor systems toward the target area. However, holding at the IP can also be conducted in a simple orbit around the IP for a pre-planned IP, or no closer than if a hasty IP is used. We have some specifics for rotary wings operating in the rows. The contact point for rotary wings will be closer to the target area and will also serve as a holding area where rotary wings can stay with relative safety, wait and plan for the next attacks. Since rotary wings usually operate at very low altitudes, terrain may impact communications, so relays by other assets or other solutions will need to be in place. For observations or attacks against enemies, the rotary wings will use battle positions, which are specific areas that are used 
for helicopters to hover, employ weapons, or start their runnings with guns and rockets. The intent of using defined battle positions is to keep the helicopters restricted to specific areas while having airspace outside of the BPs available for other assets taking place in the operation. The CAS check-in is a message delivered by the CAS pilot to the JTAC. It is basically a way for the pilot to tell the controller, hey, this is me, this is what I bring with me, and this is how I can support you. The check-in should include the items outlined here. The abort code is provided by the pilot, but the JTAC can decide on a different one or have it in the clear on his discretion. The check-in will be delivered only when asked for it by the JTAC. Keep in mind that the JTAC is a busy person doing other things and a long message with many details should only be delivered when he is ready to copy it. If the check-in can be relayed via an AWACS in advance, then a simple as fragged should be used to save time. Once the pilot is aware about the situation in the airspace, the JTAC will provide information about what's actually going on on the ground. The situation or AO update aims to build the pilot's situational awareness and allow for a more effective support to the ground force commander. The full template of the brief is given here. An example of how an AO update may sound like. Jedi 4, this is Warrior with AO update Alpha. Threats, we have a possible Shilka west 2 kilometers. Ground Force Commander intent is to seize the village by an armored assault from east to the west and to locate and prosecute enemy command vehicles and report enemy movements inside the village. How copies so far? Jedi 4 copies all. This is Warrior. Targets are a motorized company inside the village, friendlies, an armored platoon of main M1 main battle tanks currently holding position in the valley east 3 kilometers. Artillery, we have an 82mm mortar position, southeast 3 km, gun target line 320 to 350, max ord 12,000 feet MSL, how copy so far? Jedi 4 copies all. This is Warrior, clearances, stack and brief with hog, mark and control with Warrior. Hazards, we have high tension power line running north-south inside the village, also we have terrain to the south up to 8,000 feet MSL. Restrictions, minimize collateral damage, no effect closer than 100 meters from the village mosque. Remarks, warrior capable of smoke and laser marking. End of AO update alpha, Jedi 4 readback restrictions. Whenever possible, an AO update will be relayed via AWACS to any cast flight inbound to the AO. This saves a lot of time to all involved, it means the JTAC only delivers the AO update once and then refines it to incoming flights as needed. The CAS brief is delivered by the JTAC to the CAS flight and provides instructions for a specific attack. It comes after the pilot has already been given traffic and airspace update and the AO update, so he knows what's going on in the air and on the ground. As can be seen, the CAS brief is divided into three parts. The first one is the game plan, this gives, well, the game plan for the attack. The game plan contains type of control, method, bomb on target means ordnance released on an aiming point such as a target or a mark, bomb on coordinates means releasing ordnance by coordinates only, with the pilot not having any aiming point. Ordnance requested can be flatly discretion. Intervals, if the JTAC wishes the attack, to be a shooter-shooter with an interval between the effect generated by the first and second attack in aircraft. The second part of the brief is the 9-line, and the template is shown here. Whenever a 9-line is delivered, a readback by the pilot is mandatory for lines 4, 6, and 8. Additional readbacks may be requested by the JTAC at his discretion, for example if radio quality is low or if language or accent are an issue. Following is an example of how an entire cast brief may sound like. Jedi 4 Warrior call ready cast brief alpha. Jedi 4 ready to copy. This is Warrior cast brief alpha as follows. Type 1 in effect, bomb on target, request guns. IP Emerald. Heading 238. Distance 8.6 nautical miles. Elevation 1 to 5 MSL. Target is infantry dug in along north-south running river. Location 
North 4211317 Eastings 04226272 Mark by Red Tracers Friendies Southeast 1500 meters Egress left and back IP Emerald above 100 Warrior Jedi 4 read back elevation 125 feet Northings 4211317, Eastings 04226272, Friendlies Southeast 1500 meters. Good read back, call ready remarks and restrictions. Jedi 4 ready to copy. This is Warrior, no remarks, restrictions, make your final attack heading 220255, keep effects south of river and north of railroad, approved to ground for delivery. This is Jedi 4, final attack heading 220255, keep effects south of river and north of railroad, approved down to the ground. Jedi 4, warrior, good readback, call living IP. Talk on or target verification means we verify that after the nylon has been delivered, the JTAC and the pilot are looking at the same target. Needless to say that with friendlies nearby, a wrong target being picked may result in a dangerous friendly fire situation. Here we have some brevity words that are used quite a bit during CAS missions. Contact is used whenever referencing anything that's neither friendly or an enemy. For example, a road crossing, a house, tree line, etc. Tally and capture are verified enemy units via Mark 1 eyeball or by sensor respectively. It can be understood that the contact may sometimes be upgraded to a tally or a capture once it has been ascertained to be a target. If the token is done through the aircraft's sensors, we'll usually need coordinates and elevation or a known point, for example a nearby TRP or similar points that's predetermined by the JTAC. When the token is done with a pilot using Mark 1 eyeball, it can be based on either a GRG, a mark like a smoke mark, or both. Here is an example of a token via sensor. Note that although the TGP provides coordinates of the field center, nonetheless a token might be used as it is sometimes quicker to correlate the target this way. Also note that for tokens through sensor we use the FIDO format. The example is following a delivery of coordinates by the JTAC to the pilot. Jedi 4 Warrior slew sensor to coordinates and describe what you see. Warrior Jedi 4 contact large square shaped building. Call ready token. Ready. The length of the building's wall is unit of measure. Contact unit of measure. Western corner is anchor point. Contact anchor point. From anchor point, northwest, two units of measure. Northwest, two units of measure. Contact three times vehicles in the open. Those are your targets. Capture targets. Sometimes the attacking pilot won't be able to acquire the target prior to leaving his IP. Examples to, for why this can happen are threats prohibiting the use of a suitable IP or a dead eye sensor inoperative. For low level token, the JET uses the CDO, clock distance object, or left, right, long, short. This is done with the JTAC trying to anticipate what the pilot will see from his perspective and adjust the token accordingly rather than using cardinal directions. This is easier for the pilot. Keep in mind that a low level token is very quick and require good preparation by the JTAC prior to clearing the aircraft to leave in the IP for the attack. What the JTAC is doing is basically painting a picture for the pilot of what he should be looking at. The picture is laid out from the big to the small. If the situation allows, a distinct mark such as a smoke mark may be very useful for a token. Some brevity used for clearances. It is very important to remember that the only two phrases that allow the pilot to open fire are cleared hot for types 1 and 2 and cleared to engage for type 3. Continue is used for allowing the pilot to proceed to the next step of the attack and it must not be considered as a clearance to release ordnance. The use of marks for close air support can simplify target acquisition as well as targeting, but it is not always advisable. A smoke mark near a target might potentially alert the target that it is being marked, 
or at the very least, alert it for the presence of our forces. The use of tracers also exposes the JTAC to counter fire, because if the JTAC can shoot the target, it is likely that the target can shoot back. Laser requires specific capabilities to acquire the laser spot, as well as the aircraft be inside of 8 nautical miles from the target. Infrared is very convenient, but can only be used at night. Out of the different mark types, laser can also be used for weapon guidance. The relevant brevity phrases are listed here. It is important to remember that a laser guided weapon seeks the strongest mark in its field of view that matches the pulse repetition frequency or PRF. For this reason, it might decide to home in on the laser designator rather than on the target, and of course we'd like to avoid that. For those safety reasons, whenever the target is ground laced, we'll keep the attack heading inside of the 50 degrees cones shown here. The inner red buffer zone is in place to avoid ordnance overflying friendly heads. When possible, the pilot should call the time of flight so that the JETA can expect the impact as well as start the lasing. In terms of threat level, the situation can either be permissive or non-permissive. A permissive environment allows for a maximal usage of air asset capabilities and playtime. Those include better observation coverage when flying close or above the target area, using short-range ordnance and allowing for generally higher pace of air attacks. If the threats are significant, we'll need to spend more effort to ensure the safety of the pilots by utilizing seed strikes by air or artillery and limit ordnance deliveries to standoff types which reduces the efficiency of the CAS assets. When preparing for a CAS mission, the minimal items that need to be coordinated prior to the event are the contact point, the check-in frequency, and the vault time. In our training missions, those will usually be pre-briefed by the JTAC or FEC-A running the CAS training. For combat missions, those details will be provided by the host or the mission commander. The exceptions are ground and air alert CAS flights, which would receive the details from a controlling agency once scrambled. When possible, many more details can be coordinated in advance, as can be seen here. It is important to always remember that coordination and planning is a two-way exchange. Compared to the JTAC, the CAS pilot usually has a better understanding about the limitations and capabilities of his aircraft and himself. Those should be brought to the JTAC's attention to allow for a more suitable game plan and to avoid unrealistic requests and expectations from both sides. Likewise, the pilot should feel free to come up with his own recommendations for making better use as a cast flight and assist the JTAC in solving the mission. Be proactive. Whenever possible, we try to have graphic products prepared for the mission. Those are called GRGs or gridded reference graphics. When used by both the JTAC and the cast flights, those can significantly improve the situational awareness of all involved and speed up target handovers and correlations. Here we have two examples of GRGs, but basically a JTAC can prepare his own created, with his own style, and have it best suited for the mission at hand. A GRG will usually have some features to assist in building common language by all participants. Naming points, areas, grids, and so on. Please review our CAS TTP at Appendix I for detailed explanation about GRGs and how we use them. On the pilot side, planning should be made to meet the time on station and to prepare the CAS check-in. It is also advised to be as ready as possible in terms of situational awareness and flight readiness, for example, be after fence checks, so that the check-in would be as smooth as possible. Keep in mind that sometimes it's the JTAC's preference to have more than one flight on the contact point so that the traffic and airspace and AO update can be delivered at one go and not be repeated. If a delay is expected for the vault time, it is best to advise the JTAC in advance, for example by relaying a new expected vault time to the JTAC via AWACS. On the JTAC side, we start by making sure that our radios are set up properly. We also need to find and check our dedicated JTAC unit and verify we are properly located with line of sight to what we need to do. We should then start looking around, see what we can see and create or amplify our AO update, find target, prepare cast briefs and prioritize them. 
If needed, we should use the time prior to Castlight arrival to contact AOAX and relay our AO update or any refinements that we may have. For night operations, we have some brevity calls that are mandatory whenever using the infrared pointer. The pilot should confirm that he knows where the friendly end of the infrared beam is, as well as where the target end is. Distinguishing the two is done with a snake, in which the JTAC waves the pointer around the target area. The apparent movement of the pointer helps the pilot in acquiring the friendlies at the static end and the target side on the moving end of the beam. Prior to giving clearance, the JTAC must receive visual friendlies call and one of the two following calls. Tally target if the pilot sees the target or contact sparkle when the pilot sees the target side of the beam with sufficient quality to fire at that mark. We have two ways to coordinate timing of desired effects on target. The decision of which one to use depends mostly on the capability of the aircraft and the pilots. Either way, a time check is done in order to verify that all participants have the same time reading within 5 seconds or so. Flights, this is Warrior. Time check. 13, 42, 23, 24, 25, 26. Jedi 4, good time check. Claw 3, good time check. During a close air support mission, the JTAC is authorized to use ordnance employed with a certain safe distance from friendly units. The authority to clear air attacks inside of the safety distance is with the ground force commander. Such condition would be a danger close attack. The JTAC will provide the pilot with the ground force commander initials on the remark sections of the cast brief. Doing so, the ground force commander assumes responsibility for the risk of the attack hitting his own troops on the ground. The TLE or target location error is the degree of accuracy in which the JTAC can provide targeting data for the pilots. When the degree of accuracy decreases, it might limit us during target correlations as well as the ability to conduct bomb on coordinates if needed. Sometimes we can have a JTAC and FAK operating together. Having a FAK in support is very valuable. The JTAC will be in charge but can delegate one or more clearances to the FAK. Brief, preparation and delivery of AO updates and cast briefs. Stack handling the holding areas and the confliction of the aircraft. Mark means marking of targets for correlation and attacks. And control, having the actual control of the attack and providing the weapon release clearances. The FAK should have good situational awareness and have a separate communication frequency with the JTAC for coordination throughout the mission. AWACS can also be of great support in relaying the AO updates, providing status of incoming cast flights, and providing alerts regarding air threats to the cast flights. Finally, it should be emphasized that the pilot knows his airframe and his own capabilities better than any of the controllers do. Therefore, he should push any suggestion that can improve his efficiency during the planning as well as the execution phase of the mission. Some examples are given here. The next section focuses on specific items for JTACs and FAKAs. In general, each of the two have strong points that should be put to use in the mission. Typically, the JTAC will have better understanding about the disposition of friendly units and can be more focused on the actual cast related tasks as it doesn't need to fly an aircraft in the meantime. The FAK is likely to have a better view of the enemy forces from his point of view, as well as better communications and knowledge about supporting cast lights. Those points may be utilized by delegating brief and stack to the FAK while having mark and control retained by the JTAC. An air request is a message delivered to the AWACS in a specific air request net frequency. This message contains the details needed by the AWACS to scramble or retask flights to support the close air support effort. More details on the air request are available under the WINGS AWACS TTP document. When artillery is available, it can sometimes be used to provide ground-based suppression of enemy air defenses. The use of artillery requires proper timing, as well as knowing time of flight and max ordinate data for the type of artillery rounds and their trajectory. The benefits of ground-based seed is that it is potentially very flexible in timing, and it assists in conserving the focus, ordinance, and effort of the cast flights, or the actual close air support priorities. A couple of tips for JTACs and FAKAs in utilizing cast flights are the sensor tasking, 
and the use of type 3 control when possible. The sensor tasking is valuable in that it utilizes the superior point of view of the pilots in looking for enemy forces. This can improve the JTAC and the Ground Force Commander situational awareness and also allow for a quick correlation of targets for cast briefs. This is done by attaching a target captured in a sensor task by a specific cast flight as a line 5 in a cast brief for that same flight. Having a cast flight engaging targets under a type 3 control is very useful. It allows the JTAC to proceed with additional cast briefs to other flights while knowing that enemy forces are already being engaged. Knowing that CAS flight is already doing work for you reduces pressure and helps you focus at the tasks ahead. This concludes the theory part of the lesson. For any questions or comments, please contact one of the JTACs or instructors of the wing before proceeding to the practical exercise. Thank you for watching and good luck!